Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome back to the podcast. We're here today to talk about the basics of home insurance with Fabio Faschi, who is an insurance professional based out of North America. Hi, how are you? Hi Gabriella, thank you for having me and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for coming on. Um, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Tell us about yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Fabio. I'm uh, based out of North America on the East Coast. I uh, currently head up partnerships and help with operations for Counterpart, uh, management liability insurance carrier. But I've spent the uh, last six, seven years with various insurance companies and uh, insure tech startups um, across the space. So, Great. Looking forward to learning more about um, all of those different things. I don't know much about insurance, so um, I'll definitely learn a lot, to le lot today. But before we do that, okay. uh, we'll do a section we call, Have You Met Fabio? So that's where we um, learn a little bit more about the things you like. Um, so our first uh, question is, what's your favorite book? Sure. Yeah. So um, I, I used to read a lot more when I was younger, um, particularly on the fantasy side. Um, and then I got really into audiobooks more recently when I was commuting and then got back into reading um, after the pandemic. But um, I'd say... A little bit of a throwaway, but my um, my favorite book probably on the whole would be The Hobbit. Um, I, I know, you know Tolkien and Lord of the Rings obviously goes very strong, but The Hobbit's a book I read first when I was much younger, reread it when I was older, and uh, always captured the fantasy essence for me. Honestly, I think that's probably my favorite of the Tolkien books. Um, the Lord of the Rings can be quite long, and particularly as a kid, very um, tedious. <laughs> But The right. Hobbit is just, I don't know, it, it really captures the imagination, as you said. It does, absolutely. And to me, it's mm. the most lively of the of three, um, you know, as a, as a piece of literature itself. Yeah. Um, and I guess because it was written for kids as well, it's, um, yeah, much more sure. kid-friendly. <laughs> right. Certainly more accessible. Mm. Um, is there a movie that you've enjoyed recently? Recently, I uh, don't usually watch a lot of movies when they come when they first come out. I'll usually watch them much later. But uh, recently, uh, I'm saying the streaming services, uh, the Glass Onion movie, so the the sequel to Knives Out, um, it's a big splash on Netflix. Though so that one I really enjoyed, and uh, I'll also give an honorable mention to Bullet Train um, because that one was much better than I anticipated with a very quirky kind of plot and uh, cast. So what's Bullet Train about? I haven't heard of that one. Oh boy, yeah. So the plot, in essence, is uh, without spoiling too much, is basically um, a sort of hitman is is hired to go onto a train to pick up a package um, from a client, and complications arise, and it's a mix between an action thriller and comedy, uh, kind of that you know, very deep, dark British humor, and. Uh, have that action gore genre vibe so uh yeah certainly action packed but an interesting movie for sure okay i'll have to check that out that sounds interesting and unex i love unexpectedly fun movies yeah yeah, yeah. no it is it's very unexpectedly fun notes mm. um are you listening to any podcasts so uh i don't typically because i tend to gravitate towards audiobooks. I don't do too many podcasts, but recently I have, uh, on recommendations from friends, started to tap a little into Joe Rogan. He's a very popular podcaster here in the U.S., obviously on the Spotify side. Um, so a little bit of him, but more so for myself on the hobby side, I, I'll listen to uh, 
yeah, Ear Biscuits, which is the, the podcast by uh, Rhett and Link from uh, Good Mythical Morning. If you're familiar with those guys, again, two comedians that kind of copy cover a broad range of uh, topics on their podcast. As well. Interesting. Have to check those out. Um, yeah, always learning about new podcasts. It's so it's so yeah. funny how many podcasts there are at there are out there. Right. Um, do you have a role model? Uh, a role model. I mean, honestly, yeah, I've gotten asked this question a bit in the past. For me, I mean, the most obvious answer was always my parents. Uh, I'm a, I'm the fifth of six children, and so for my parents, you know, I've raised us all. Um, especially, as, you know, they were born in Italy, um, and so to, to have raised the family so large and moving around as much as we did, uh, you know, was always for me. You know, my parents were both sides of the coin in terms of both raising a family and teaching me how to then further my career later on. So uh, they've always been my role models, of course. But I, yeah, I've been fortunate that not just in you know, in my parents, but in my career, I've had a number of mentors that I look to as role models. But I wouldn't say I don't have one particular hero uh, that I go to kind of to model around. I really do like it when your role models are very accessible. You know, they're people that you actually know and your parents, such such great role models um, because you really learn so much from them. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a cliche answer for sure, but it's very hard for me to, I think, you know, I, I certainly look at great figures in history and you look at them for whatever they're, you know, uh, whether it be the charisma of, say, a Winston Churchill or a Barack Obama or something like that, or obviously, you know, the kind of economic savviness of a Warren Buffett, but it's hard for me to, you know, subscribe to them as my full role model because I don't know them as an accessible individual, like you said. Mm, yeah. Um, and is there a course that's inspired you? A course, yeah. So, you know, I uh, I originally graduated in, in diplomacy and international relations, and I took in the majority of my courses in, you know, international studies and whatnot. But I took a few courses in my minor for economics, and one course in particular, which was just a simple economics 101 course, was taught by a professor who had worked on Wall Street and was now uh, teaching well into his retirement. Uh, and he inspired me single-handedly through that course, not just about economics, but how to kind of approach the world as a whole and being skeptical about almost everything and how to utilize. This is something I, c I come back to often in my day-to-day -day working in terms of being skeptical about results and coming to conclusions and how it influences you know, businesses as a whole. So that was certainly a, you know, a very important course for me, honestly, that I still think back to to this day. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think my courses as well, what I'm studying as well um, at the moment, and they're trying to teach us critical thinking. It's so hard to do. Um, so it sounds like that um, lecturer really got to you. And I think that's such a great skill to have. Yeah. It's not and taking it was, everything. Uh, yeah, that it was pure credit to to his teaching methodology and uh, you know making topics that aren't easily understood very accessible and trying to connect with his his students really at a personal level. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, how do you define household management? Right. So, uh, household management. Right. If I were to kind of make up my own dictionary definition for it, something around the upkeep mitigation and restoration of damage to the household um that really because to me those are the three facets right you have the upkeep which is kind of um you know there's going to be just degradation over time of the household right mitigation is how you prevent future damage right and restoration is damage that's occurred and how do you restore it so household management to me is 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 that right <laughs> And are there any misconceptions about hassle management? Um, yeah, and I'm talking again from my perspective as a, as a cynic on the insurance side. You know, I would say household management is that yeah, mitigation is the most optimistic of the goal, but restoration is the most likely. You know, what I mean by that is, you know, I deal with a uh, we'll, we'll touch upon this the kind of how insurance um, really is is kind of the emergency button, right? to push, um, but it's also really there as, as your only true fail safe if something were to happen to your house, because 
of really what it's there designed to protect against hurricanes, natural disasters, things that you can't really mitigate more than a certain amount. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the biggest misconception here is, you know, people want to get really cheap insurance because they've installed a fire alarm, for example, but a fire alarm is there to alert firefighters once the building is on fire mostly to protect people and limit the damage. It is very unlikely it is going to save the vast majority of the damage from occurring. Um, so that's just a, a sad reality, but you know, one that is important to understand when you're talking about insurance. <laughs> so what is insurance or home insurance specifically? Yeah, yeah. So, so home insurance, and we're going to break this down because this industry and I'm talking about insurance as a whole is is I'm going to say riddled with, you know, terminology and terminological differences that are kind of combined or skewed at times. Um, but home insurance, right, is, I like to think about it in its most romantic sense, is really the hedging of the bet that nothing is going to happen to your house or property, right? Um, insurance, you know, a lot of it gets a lot of grief and a stigma is that thing that people don't want to pay. It is actually the responsible person at the casino of life, right? That you're going and you bought a house and now you want to protect it. You have two options. Don't get insurance. And you're saying, hey, if I don't get insurance, nothing's going to happen to my house. You get insurance. You're saying, well, but if something does happen, I'm paying a little, a little bit more to, you know, not have to pay it all in full. And the cost benefit there is substantial. We can get more into that. But then the second protection that's honestly much less considered when it comes to home insurance is protection for your general liability, now, at least in the US. Um, and this does vary by country. So I'm going to speak you know, mostly, obviously, the terminology of the, how it's done in North America for now. But it is generally universal. It's going to be, you know, it's referred to as property and casualty, um, is the, the family of insurance that home insurance lives under. And the property side is pretty self-explanatory, right? That's your home, the actual physical property itself being protected. But the casualty side is protection, basically to protect you as someone who has acquired this large asset, which typically comes into play if you were going to be sued by another part, right? And then we talk about liability. Okay. So what kind of, what, can you give an example of that maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, certainly give some examples. Um, so the, the, right, the most obvious example on each side, right, would be the property side, your home itself catches fire, right? That's your, mm -hmm. your home insurance coming into play to restore your house to where it was before the fire. That whole concept mm -hmm. of what they call, refer to technically as indemnification, right? A lot of movies like to romanticize the fact that you can scheme your insurance, right, to, to get out ahead of where you were before. That's not the concept of insurance. The concept of insurance is to get you back to where you were before the claim or the accident occurred, right? And the same goes for other types of insurance as well. But in general, right, your home burns down, you're going to get the money to repair or restore your home. You're not going to get to build a, a mansion because your 500 square foot apartment burned down, right? Mm -hmm. Um so that's, you know, one, one, another misconception of that's right now on the casualty side or the liability side, right? Which is the other half that is bundled into your home insurance as a protection as, as a homeowner, um, you could for, for a completely erroneous reason that has nothing to do with a connection to your home specifically, you could be sued personally. You could be, it could be for, um, you know, a common example of people like to bring up is if you are a dog owner, you can be held responsible for liability of your dog biting the neighbor's kids. That's just one example. It has nothing to do with the fact that the dog lives on the home or anything. It could be held liable for anything. But the moment you are held in litigation for it, your homeowner's insurance policy does provide you with coverage to fight that litigation. And the reason that the insurance system is built this way is because it's the secondary way of protecting your asset. Because if you didn't have that coverage and someone sues you, then you would likely have to sell your property. You would likely have to sell that home. And so it's an indirect way to protect you right on both ends. One is the obvious factor, which is again, your property burning down and being damaged itself. And secondarily is you 
having to pay out a gross amount through litigation. Interesting. I knew, I mean, I knew a little bit about, I guess, why home insurance is there. If your house burns down, you get to buy, you can build a new house, but I didn't know about the litigation thing. That's really interesting. Yeah, um, and, and we can get into you know, some more detail in terms of kind of the like specific breakdown of the home insurance. But the last point I wanted to point out, you know, when we talk about home insurance as a whole is really been for the, and I've kind of led us down a little bit of a path in terms of simplifying the discussion, but home insurance is broadly referred to as you're thinking about insurance, right? For, for a house, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in truth, there is, there's several flavors of home insurance. Um, and they're all technically referred to as home insurance, but it could be insurance for an actual house, insurance for uh, an apartment is still technically referred to as home insurance. It could be insurance for a condo or a co uh, like a cooperative, as there are plenty of here in you know New York. Uh, it could be landlord insurance, which is if you know it's an investment property that you yourself don't live in. And there's actually even specific policies for if it's a mobile home, like a trailer home, right, as opposed to like a structured policy, or even uh, modified coverage policies if it's a some sort of a specific home estate that has specific modeling uh, criteria requirements. Wow, I didn't know there were so many different types, but it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> no there's point a having... lot of a lot of customization there, right? <laughs> Yeah, no point having a mansion um, and insured by someone's apartment type insurance. It's not going to cover everything. Exactly. Right. Um, something you did mention before is um, people thinking that if their small apartment burns down, then they're going to be able to afford to buy a mansion to replace it with their insurance. I guess yeah. if someone overinsures their house, yeah. can that happen or is that not something? Will they get caught yeah. out? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great um, that's a great question, and it's really the core of your insurance policy. Um, and something that comes up most often is, you know, what what do you look for in insurance policy? And really, the whole negotiation between you and an insurance carrier is going to revolve around. Um, bear with me again, because this has many names. The dwelling value of the property. Um, and that mm -hmm. is going to be, so the dwelling value also referred to technically as coverage A or the replacement cost of the property is kind of the core of your policy. And that determines exactly what you're getting at is going to be, what is the, what is going to be the replacement value should this, you know, worst case scenario be completely destroyed, be completely totaled or, or, or you know, burned down in a fire. Uh, now. I'm going to set aside renter's insurance, right? Because renter's insurance actually doesn't afford you any coverage for the building itself because you're a renter, so you don't own the building. So, you know, you only have to worry about what's inside of it. But for a condo or, you know, the difference between obviously insuring a thousand square foot condominium or a townhouse versus, you know, three-story mansion, you know, 6,000 square feet, it's obviously going to be the, that initial cost. And so you're typically going to, when you're shopping for insurance, you're typically going to provide your insurance agent or the carrier themselves with you know the details of your property that you're insuring, and they're going to come back to you with an evaluation of what it's going to cost to replace. And most mm -hmm. insurance carriers, you know, either proactively or upon request, can also give you a very detailed breakdown of what that entails and how they're getting to that you know information. And a lot of them, especially on the insure tech side where I'm from. I've started to use you know several data pools on how it's insured, how it was previously insured. Obviously, all of the details of the interior, the square footage, the materials used, the age of these systems, right, and um, but the, obviously the propensity, of the risk there is factored into the pricing. But the core number we're trying to arrive at is what it's going to cost to rebuild everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's really. The insurance company is not going to let you just pick a number out of a hat. They're not just going to let you say like, hey, you know, Gabriella, you have a great, you know, a, a thousand square foot home. We can't insure this for $5 million. You're not going to set that number. They're going to, mm -hmm. they're going to set that number for you. And then you can negotiate it with them and say like, no, I don't think that's right. Um, but this is one of the most, one of the most common misconceptions when it comes to purchasing home insurance 
because there can often be a discrepancy between the purchasing price of a house and what you're going to insure mm -hmm. it for. So when you buy a house, you buy a house for, I mean, again, I'm in New York's backyard. Houses here sell for far more than what they cost to rebuild. And that is because, you know, real estate, rule number one, location, location, location. Uh, you're not paying for the materials, you're paying for where it is. Uh, mm. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind is don't be surprised if the replacement cost of your property is not equal to what you paid for it. But I guess at least you have still have the land. Well, right, exactly. And that's but that's and that's the big consideration there too, right? Is when you mm -hmm. are purchasing a property, you are purchasing the land as well as what's on it. Mm -hmm. So, what happens um, if you underinsure it? Like, is that something that also in, mm -hmm. you know insurance agents will avoid? Um, you know, yeah, when you do yeah. the evaluation. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Um, now, again, typically most of the burden the burden of proof of, of insuring is going to fall on the insurance agent. It's not going to be something that you as the policyholder yourself will get to dictate. And so where it comes up more often is going to be if an insurance agent does not do their due diligence and for some reason you are underinsured. And this does happen, but again, the insurance company, their number one goal is to make sure you're not going to be underinsured. Because if you are underinsured, not only does it expo you know, expose, you know, obviously, their own professional liability in terms of doing what's right, but ultimately, they have to end up paying what's, at, what's there out of pocket as well. So um, it's something that's kept in checks and balance. And again, one of the reasons insurance agents exist is to negotiate that exact, uh, you know, that exact exposure. So I imagine that, you know, if I buy a house and then I get it insured and then I make improvements, I put in a pool, I put in a second house, I imagine that the cost to rebuild would be higher. Does that mean that I have to redo the insurance policy afterwards? Yeah, that's a, so that's a great question. And um, typically, uh, you know, a, a good insurance agent will be checking in with their clients every year or at the renewal of the policy, which is for home insurance is typically mm -hmm. going to be annually. Right. And one of the things that they look for is to see if there's been any improvements made to the property itself, any changes there. Right. Because, for example, if you had put in a whole new story or a whole new wing onto the house, then yeah, you just added to the square footage of the property. It's going to change the cost to rebuild it. Um, and so these are, these are normal kind of steps in the lifespan of a policy. And you're exactly right. But if uh, at the end of the day, if you're changing what's being insured, then yes, one, you have a duty, a duty on your side as a, as the insured to report those changes, um, because what's going to happen every year as your policy renews is you're going to reaccept the terms of your policy, and on that application for that reacceptance, you're going to say you're going to confirm the details of what's being insured, and so if your house was insured in year one and it's three thousand square feet and you added three thousand more square feet and you don't disclose that to your insurance agent. You are actually, not to make this sound scarier than it is, but you are committing insurance fraud because that's exactly what it is. It's a misrepresentation of what's being insured. Now, mm -hmm. and again, most insurance companies, if it's a, a elevated risk, for home insurance, it's pretty rare. It would have to be a rather large house to catch their attention. But you know, typically in insurance, this is kept in checks and balance by the insurance companies conducting audits or sometimes an inspection depending on the risks um, every so often to make sure that everything is in accordance to what's being, you know, what they're being told. Okay. So about once a year, so once a year, you have to renew the insurance and that's at the point that you will let the insurance agent know that something's changed. Do they contact you or are you expected to go contact them? Yeah, that depends a little bit by, you know, the insurance okay. carrier. They all have different mm -hmm. ways of doing things. You know, in today's mm -hmm. world, I'd say, the last five, 10 years, there's been obviously a huge evolution in kind of this self-service, do-it-yourself insurance. And so they'll, mm -hmm. you might just get an email. Honestly, you might not get much okay. more than an email. But if you're working with a tra traditional insurance agent or obviously someone that's handling a large portfolio of your insurance, they might you know walk you through once a year kind of making sure everything is done, which is why you probably heard you know a lot of insurance agents kind of handle the portfolios for their clients, whether it be for 
you know, it's usually not just their home insurance, the car insurance, but if they have any mm-hmm. additional, you know, toys or jewelry or, or you know, accessories like motorcycles or trailers or a second house, right? They're going to want to kind of review all of this once a year. Okay. Um, and, but they're not like inspecting everything every year or not. For no, it's regular, very rare. Not for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. For, <laughs> some, for certain high net worth properties that there's either an extended exposure risk, right? They're going to probably be expecting this every year. So we take a look at, you know, celebrity houses, obviously in mansions. I mean, those obviously one aren't being handled by the celebrities themselves or being handled by fi- you know, their financial planners and, but yes, those you know houses of extended worth are reevaluated, you know, annually and typically inspected annually as well because there's mm. one you're talking about, you know, much larger exposure. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot, a lot bigger cost to the insurance company if something happens to it. Exactly right. So you mentioned before that there's renters insurance and then there's also like landlords insurance. So. Does everyone need home insurance? Is it just homeowners? Um, what's the difference between? Yeah, sorry, that's too many questions yeah. all, all all together. No, right. Well, I'll start with you know the first question, right? You asked, which mm-hmm. is who needs uh, home insurance, and and I love mm-hmm. this question. It's one of the questions that I, I get asked the most. Um, I've been asked the most throughout my career, just in both by friends, family, but also just by clients, honestly asking if they were doing the right thing. Home insurance has the advantage that at least, again, in the United States, if you are purchasing a home with a mortgage, the mortgage company is going to require you to get home insurance. Um, and so if most people aren't asking themselves the question, oh, do I need to get it? They're just being told by a mortgage company, hey, yes, you have to go get home insurance. So they have to check, you know, they have to check that checkbox. Um, who needs it? I used to pose my, you know, I used to pose my friends that a simple litmus test to say, you know, one, do you own a property? If yes, then get home insurance. Two, do you own any personal belongings? Okay, so you're a renter, right? And here I'm really talking about like okay, personal belongings that you care about if they were to you know, get destroyed. Then yes, get home insurance. And three, could you potentially be sued by anyone? And the answer is yes, because everyone could, you never, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. So the truth is everyone is actually a candidate for some type of insurance, because even if you don't own a property and you are just renting and, and I, I myself have, have, just because I live in the metro area, prefer, I preferred to rent, uh, more than, uh, more than having a home in the area. And, you know, renter's insurance was something I obviously being in the industry, uh, was always going to have. Right. And so it's not a matter of, mm-hmm. about owning the property, but it's about the simple exposure and for what you, what you're talking about, the comparison between, yeah, what always makes me laugh is people will say, whether it be home insurance or renter's insurance, oh, this is expensive, right? It's like expensive compared to what? Because compared to the worst case scenario, it is very cheap. Pay about on average, you know, for a normal kind of renter in the area, you might pay. $150 American annually. That's insuring $150,000 of stuff if there was a fire here. And this is something mm-hmm. that's happened. Yeah, that's obviously, no, knock on wood, there's no fire, but it's something that's happened to people all the you know, all the time. It's happened to friends of mine. It's happened to colleagues of mine. And some of them have had insurance and some of them haven't. Now I tell you, for $150 a year, what you're purchasing is peace of mind. Mm-hmm. So you also mentioned renter's insurance. So is that different? I mean, I imagine that's different from yeah. home insurance. Do you mind explaining yeah. renter's insurance a bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's basically... It's it's basically a simplified version of home insurance. It's still considered under the umbrella of home insurance, uh, broadly speaking, but it's written on its own policy form. Um, so again, the technical terminology for a, kind of a standard home insurance form is going to be an HO3. That's the technical boring term. The technical boring term for a renter's policy is going to be an HO4. And then, like I said, those all those other flavors I mentioned to you, like an HO6 is for condominiums, an HO7 is for mobile homes. But let's focus on the renter's insurance. 
Uh, renter's insurance is basically going to provide you all the same protection that a home insurance policy would minus that dwelling that we talked about mm -hmm. that that coverage a isn't going to cover the the property because there is no property the property mm -hmm. the separate coverage that you are that you are going to care about for your renter's insurance is your personal property coverage um which is also something that you dictate on your homeowner's policy but obviously on your renter's insurance that's really what you're you know, purchasing it for apart from the coverage on the liability side as well. So the two policies are actually exactly the same in terms of how they're kind of laid out in terms of the, the core coverages. Um, but your home insurance has those two additional two additional coverages, one for the dwelling itself mm -hmm. and two, uh, the second coverage also referred to as coverage B, it's called other structures coverage, mm -hmm. which is um, for other structures on the property besides the main property. So. But other than that, they're two very similar in, in structure. So I actually imagined home insurance was just for the building. So is it actually also for the things inside it, the vehicles, um, yep. that yeah. type of thing as well? Yeah. So, so okay, kind of getting a little bit deeper here, a home insurance policy on the property side is made up of four coverages. So coverage A we've already talked about, which is the dwelling. Mm -hmm. Coverage B I just mentioned is called other structures coverage, and it's for anything that's not in that core dwelling. So that could be a fountain, a gazebo, a swimming pool, a shed, something that's not actually just a fence, right? Something that's not actually touching the building itself. Coverage C is your personal property, which is quite simply your stuff, your belongings, right? So anything inside, if you were to pick up the house and shake it, anything that falls out. Coverage D is your loss is, is a little bit of a different coverage it's called your loss of use coverage or uh, sometimes referred to as ale coverage which stands for additional living expenses and this is a pretty particular coverage because it's basically coverage to pay for if you are not able to live in your home for a certain amount of time after it's been damaged so let's say you living in your home that you've insured responsibly gets hit by lightning, blows a hole in the roof. You obviously can't live there when it's being repaired. So they're repairing the roofs. And in the meantime, you have your additional living expenses to cover for maybe the hotel that your family's staying at or, you know, additional, you know, wherever they might be staying that, uh, you know, in the meantime, so that might accrue also a longer, a longer commute you might not be able to you know, uh, use your kitchen. So you have to eating out expenses and it's basically the insurance company's way of saying like, Hey, while you're, while we're repairing your home, here's kind of, you know, the help with the accommodations of what other alternative accommodations you might have. Okay. That's good. I didn't realize that was covered. Cause I feel like that would be a, a big factor in stress. Um, <laughs> not just the repairing and the whole life being overturned, but also having to organize everything afterwards and worrying about the cost of that. Yeah, mm. yeah, no, absolutely. And so this is like, yeah, the coverage that exists, exists um, precisely to, to help with that, right? Um, the R coverages that do have a, a limit. So again, it's, but it's, it's uh, conducive to both sides, obviously want to mm -hmm. get you back in your house as quickly as possible. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they don't want you um, eating at the finest restaurants every night. Right, exactly. Yeah, and there are some cases, albeit right, you know, rarely. It's not like, again, you might be you're, you're given a limit in terms of how much your that total coverage is, and so it's not like you're going to be going in, you know, dining and staying at the Ritz again because you your house is, uh, you know, a thousand square foot regular home can't afford to stay at the Ritz Carlton. Mm. So you also mentioned before that. There are sort of three um, factors to the home, and so it was um, maintenance. Um, oh, I've forgotten already. So <laughs> the repairs, maintenance, and yeah. uh, prevention, yeah, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, prevention. You used actually better better terms mm -hmm. than than I did, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. But those so, those three right are they're comprised not just the household management, but obviously on on my side is kind of the risk management portion of, of household gestation. So does do insurance companies take those into account? Like if someone is really good at keeping up the maintenance and preventing things, would they include that in reducing the cost 
Um, or is that just something that you, you recommend for everyone? <laughs> well, one, it's something I definitely you'll personally recommend. But to add, so yes and no to your second question. It's not like they're like, hey, oh, we just know Gabrielle is an excellent household manager. She's going to get a 50% discount. That's not how it's going to work, right? But they are things that are considered in terms of, so I'll give some examples, like in terms of upkeep and maintenance, right? The biggest things there, of course, are uh, having to do with the age of the home itself. So mm -hmm. we talked about, again, how they get to that dwelling value, what they're ultimately going to insure the house for. Um, they're going to look at four major systems there. It's going to be the elect the age of the electrical, the plumbing, the water, but, sorry, <laughs> the, the water, right, and the, is the, and the, blind, the heating, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the roof. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the roof. So those four core systems of the household they're going to look at to understand what the age of these systems are. And that's going to be a big part, not just in the pricing of the home itself and how you're ultimately going to be insured, but also if the company, if the insurance company is going to be you know, willing to insure you at all. There are, there are certain you know, insurance companies that are only willing to insure risks of a certain criteria and a certain standard. Um, and then there are specialty companies that exist to cover you know, those risks that you don't, yeah, that standard insurance carriers won't insure. So there is that different, those differences there between the insurance companies that exist there. And so that's all handled right on the upkeep space. They want to see that mm -hmm. you have a roof generally, I'm going to throw out some numbers here, but generally they, you know, they want to see a roof that's less than ideally less than 15 years old, right? Um, in some cases though, they, you know, if it's more than 15 years old, they might inspect the house prior to insuring it or immediately after it's been insured to see if they're going to keep that policy or not. So that is something that does occur, right? Because they want to make sure it's in, it's in good, good standing, right? Pride of mm -hmm. ownership. It's what they refer to it as in terms of you not being a, a moral hazard of someone that's going to let this house dilapidate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the mitigation side, but we're going to set it, we're going to set aside restoration because restoration really your goal as a whole, you know, as a home insurance owner, the restoration is actually exactly what you're passing off to the insurance company. So that's on mm -hmm. them. So they got to handle the restoration. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the mitigation, however, is something that insurance companies, you know, do reward if you, mm -hmm. um, and obviously something they also provide some help for on their end as well, but mitigation is something that they do prefer. Right, so if you have central burglar and fire alarms are the most obvious things, right? They want you to have, you know, burglar and fire alarms installed. I'll give another example is uh, if you have a pool, most insurance companies require that pool to be fenced. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason is because they don't want it accessible to anyone else that could anyone else, right? Without intentionally, <laughs> if if the neighbor's kid will go into your backyard drunk and falls into it. Like that's an mm -hmm. extended, this is a significant liability exposure. Mm -hmm. There is this concept of not just mitigation, but avoidance of what they call attractive nuisances. So, um, diving boards on pools are an attractive nuisance. Trampolines in backyards are an attractive nuisance. Some insurance companies simply won't insure you if you have these things on your property, because they know they come with an extensive liability risk, right? Um, the other big one that we already kind of talked about is dogs. There are certain mm -hmm. uh, dog breeds that um, statistically, where you know, shown to be more aggressive or less aggressive. Now, legislation here has actually recently changed in the past years in the U.S. that insurance companies aren't discriminating by dog breed, um, but that was a big thing, you know. Pit bulls were obviously number one on that list in terms of, you know, and other, other mixed breeds in general. But again, it was, it's all for the insurance companies, it's all a numbers game when it comes to mitigation. Mm -hmm. And they want to see, yeah, the, the, when they don't have the exposure on the liability side, of course. Mm -hmm. So they will pay for some of, will they pay for some of that or are they just going to reward you for having that? 
They generally will, will, will reward you for it. Um, so there mm -hmm. are some things. And when I say reward, again, it's it's very marginal, I'm going to say. And this returns mm -hmm. to my first point in terms of the misconception that you might get on a portion of the premium, you might get, you know, uh, maybe a hundred dollars or, you know, two, two to three percent off for having a fire alarm or a burglar alarm or both in some cases. And this varies by insurance carrier, but it's not going to, again, it's not going to swing your price drastically. Um, mm -hmm. Some insurance companies have started to have started to provide these features and that's actually part of their policy. So they say, hey, just for signing up and being a policyholder, we're going to send you this alarm to help monitoring your, you know, whatever it might be. Um, this has actually recently evolved on the commercial side of insurance too, and I'm not going to go too far into that. But one of the things, so a, a counterpart that we do on our side, on the commercial side, for example, is we actually insure commercial small businesses. And but by being a policyholder of ours, we actually provide you complementarily a series of HR coverages that mitigate your exposures on that in that realm, which Ooh. is the same concept that they've done on home insurance, right? So saying like, hey, you're signing up for a policy. We don't want your house to burn down. Here's an alarm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so you, we've also talked a little bit about different insurance companies. I guess, how do you go about picking which insurance company? I would have no idea. They all seem the same to me. Yeah. Well, and that's really, there's a very practical solution, right, at first. Mm -hmm. And the first part, the first part, at least, is very practical. And it's getting getting your options. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that sounds ridiculously simplistic, but right, no, that's really is the first part of the challenge. Is and and I'm going to recommend that you know the best method of distribution. Well, I'm a little bit biased because it's what I used to do, but is is working with an insurance professional, like a broker, mm -hmm. an agent, to get those options. Right, and in today's world, especially in the the personal lines side of insurance, so your individual home and auto insurance, there's a plethora of options there in terms of where you can go and get connected and find the options for you. And step one is really understanding what you need, right? We've had mm -hmm. a large part of our conversation so far has been dealing with misconceptions and even understanding, okay, where do I start, right? And who's driving mm -hmm. the conversation? Like, do I have to know how much my house is worth? No. The answer is you don't. You have to have a conversation with someone that can then explain to you exactly how the process is going to go. So you're going to apply for home insurance. They're going to ask you to provide details on what you're trying to insure. And right in mm -hmm. our case, the simplest scenario, I own this house. Here are the characteristics of the house. This is how old this is. They might say, great, who is living in the house? Do you have a dog? You know, Do you have a trampoline? Whatever it might be. They might ask you questions about your professional exposure. They might say, oh, you're do you have professional exposure on the liability side? Because mm -hmm. then they might recommend something additional to you. There's a whole slew of other products that exist ancillary, right, to help you, to help kind of round out your home insurance. Mm -hmm. We talked about personal property generally, but for example, if, if it's a married couple and they have very expensive wedding rings, your personal property coverage is only going to cover jewelry up to a certain amount. If you mm -hmm. have a specific, if you have a $30,000 wedding ring, you're going to want to get that insured separately. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little details here that make it worth, you know, first and foremost, having the conversation with an insurance professional to answer the question, what do I need to get? Mm -hmm. Then once you have your options, right, we move on to the second step, which is actually evaluating them. Mm -hmm. um, and here, you know, the most obvious thing you're going to be able to relate to is pricing. But the other thing you need to understand is how that insurance company actually works and more importantly, how you are going to use the policy. So if you do have a claim, who exactly are you working? Are you working with your insurance agent? Are you working directly with the insurance company? What are you expected to pay out of pocket the moment you have a claim? And these are more details of the policy. But again, this is something that you is, is all kind of on the homework of your side to just at least always understand what happens you know, if, what happens if you have an accident, what do you need to do? As long as you have mm -hmm. those questions answered, then you can at least understand what your options are. 
the master. I'm going to pause there for a second because I feel like I gave you a lot of information. Yeah, there, that's a lot of information. <laughs> um, so I don't even know where to start with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically take, t- I mean, I feel like it would be like, do your research, take the time to actually understand what you're doing and talk to someone in, talk to someone, an insurance agent and understand, I guess, get the information from them and understand what they're saying. Is that kind of what yeah. you're saying? It, uh, it is. And here, here's the, the, the reality of the situation is this, is mm-hmm. you, insurance is very universal. And if you are investing, especially home insurance, if you are investing that much into a property, it is actually your financial responsibility to yourself mm-hmm. to understand how insurance works. And so while that is very different from other transactional products, right, where it's like you might not need to understand the whole rigmarole of something that you're purchasing, for insurance, it's quite frankly worth it. Because mm-hmm. if you, a lot of people buy insurance with no intention of understanding really how it works, they're getting it to check a box because, again, the mortgage company told them to get insurance. Mm-hmm. That's, I would say the vast majority of purchasers do that. And that's yeah. honestly, quite frankly, from a financial perspective, it's not very smart because at that point, it, you don't even know how to use your insurance. Then you don't really know what you're buying. Then really, you don't know why you're buying it. And we're talking again about a discrepancy in values. Like we're talking this, your home, the reason home insurance is so valuable and so important is because that is likely going to be one of the largest purchases you make into a physical asset for your entire life. Right. Mm. And so you should learn how to, you know, you should learn how it's going to be protected there. Mm-hmm. And so the little bit of due diligence to learn the insurance once in terms of at least understanding your options. And really, I'm not saying that it's research you should be doing on your, by yourself, but rather a conversation you should be having with an insurance professional, right? To walk you through exactly what it is that you're purchasing and how you're going to be able to use it. Those are the mm-hmm. two questions I think you need to get answered. What am I purchasing and how do I use it? Right. Yep. So the, Yes, always. I think, in fact, you can take those two and use it with almost everything. Buying a car, how do I use it? <laughs> right. No, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Mm. You should not, because you should not be answering one of those questions without the other, right? You yeah. shouldn't buy a car if you don't know how to use it. You shouldn't buy insurance if you don't know how to use it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I guess something that I've gathered from you know media and from family friends is not all insurance companies are trustworthy. I mean, maybe that's uh, a biased opinion from outside, but um, how can you tell, like, how do you know that the insurance company that you're going with is trustworthy? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And honestly, it has, it has less to do with trust, I would say, and more to mm-hmm. do with stability. Um, again, the romanticism, right, is that there's some, insurance agent behind it is trying to steal every nickel from your family but that's not it's just not going to work that way in most cases but there is a matter of like stability of like how the insurance company right how they distribute their insurance is a great mm-hmm. example so the vast majority right of um in the vast majority of cases you might be getting insurance from an insurance agent insurance agents are often representatives of multiple insurance companies when mm-hmm. I was an insurance agent, I didn't just work with one insurance company. I worked with yeah. about 50. So as an independent insurance agent, right, I had access to 50 different products. That's the service I gave my customers was largely dictated by my service. However, you know, if they liked working with me or if they didn't like working with me. Now, once the policy is in place, of course, that's a different experience. But I want to separate those two experiences first because that is very important because some people may have liked or not working with me and that is independent of the product I was selling them. Mm-hmm. Then there are some people that didn't like the product I was selling them at the end or something happened, right? And they didn't like the product I was selling them or whatever it might be. And that is also independent of them you know, working with me. They might just actually not like the product. Mm-hmm. So that has to do with a whole concept of insurance agents and the difference between it's called a captive insurance agent versus an independent insurance agent. So I myself, I represented, I represented multiple insurance companies. So I was independent of any single one of them. 
There are some insurance companies that only work with a captive insurance agent, meaning that insurance agent can only sell products from that one company. And there's honestly, there's advantages and disadvantages to either. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one has to do with you know, specialization. Sometimes the captive agents only have access to those products. And honestly, uh, uh, most likely they are the only ones that have access to those products. Um, but again, whether or not those are the products that are right for your situation is mm -hmm. highly dependent. But um, yeah, so in terms of trust, you know, trust, there are obviously a number of financial metrics that you could look at. So AM best ratings for financial stability of the insurance companies. Um, the truth is the vast majority of insurance companies after a certain amount of time will start to more or less equalize, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of... Uh, in terms of their stability. Yeah. The general safe rule, again, I'm sure there's exceptions to this, but if they've been around for 15 years, they're probably not gonna go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, insurance insurance companies are, yeah. uh, apart from being heavily you know, regulated and under compliance laws, um, there's the whole sub-industry of reinsurance, which is re com insurance companies reinsuring other insurance companies in case they go under. So um, a, in a standard insurance company, mm -hmm. or what's called an admitted insurance company, is actually going to be backed by uh, the United States Regulatory Fund, meaning that if they do go under and they owe you money in claims, that will actually be paid out by the government as well. So there are a number of securities there to, uh, you know, to avoid that worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, there are still insurance companies that are being created nowadays, right? That aren't uh, that aren't admitted products, and that are perfectly profitable and perfectly safe, right? In mm -hmm. terms of providing these products, and they have thousands, of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of insured uh, clients. But so, you know, my advice when it comes to it is obviously do your research, know what you're getting into, and if mm -hmm. you know, if this is your dream home, that I mean, for really any home. You want to go with a company that has a track record or at least an understanding of how that company is working. Mm -hmm. And it's usually an inverse relationship. If they are a very young company that is trying to acquire clients, and they're probably going to give you a very good coverage for a very good rate, and it might be worth it for what you're insuring. Mm -hmm. So again, what's more important than actually just saying like, oh, yes, go with the cheapest company. It's understand again, understand what you're getting into, understand who the company is and what they're doing. I'll say you have to have a full access of their financials and where they're going for the next five years, but understand, you know, who they are, what they are, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what other products they sell in, who they're backed by, um, because most of these smaller insurance companies end up being backed by a Goliath on the back end. It's, you know, they're backed by much larger com billion dollar revenue companies. So there's really very little risk in many cases. Okay. But again, it's important to just know what you're getting at. Yeah. I had no idea uh, about that there were two different types of insurance agents. I had no idea. Um, and that, yeah, it's so, I guess everything's so backed up that um, there is still risk involved, obviously, but I guess yes. it's less risky than I thought. This is again, this is again, a lot of the, you know, a lot of how, how you de-risk this is mm -hmm. of course, I working through an insurance agent because yeah. again, if you are working through a reputable insurance agent, they are not going to be working with disreputable companies. And you're mm. pushing basically the homework off onto that because no insurance yeah. agent is going to want to place business with a company that's going to wonder because it's going to want to expose their own liability. It's going to create more work for them. And obviously, it's going to lead to unhappy clients for them. So they're already doing plenty of homework on their side to make sure that, you know, if they're putting someone in front of you, it's in their, yours and their best interest, you know, that it's a valid option for them. Mm. Was there anything that we've missed that you'd like to talk about? Um, it's specifically in regards to home insurance or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think one of the, yeah, I think one of the big things uh, that, you know, I've touched upon, again, like returns to comparing coverage has been that, you um, we as consumers across other products, right, like to start with the assumption that, okay, I'm shopping for something and everything's, you know, when I'm comparing options, I'm comparing 
the same options. And that's kind of, again, another misconception when it comes to home insurance. And what I mean by, what I mean by that is that um, you know, insurance companies by design differentiate their policies. And we talked about, for example, that dwelling value, right? The replacement cost of your home. Mm -hmm. When you go shopping for that, every insurance company that provides you with a quote might come back to you with a different number. So, because some of them are going to say, they're, they're all going to go off their own evaluation. And just mm -hmm. because, I don't know, one, you know, company A says, oh, it's going to cost a million dollars. Company B might say, no, we think it's closer to $800,000 and we'll provide the price. And some company might just say, oh, no, it's actually 1.5. It might be way out there. So they're going to come back with their own evaluations on this. Generally, they're all going to be in the ballpark. But it is it does happen sometimes that because of the data that they're using, because of how they chose, because of how they choose to be more conservative or aggressive, they are going to set different parameters on your policy, which returns again to my first piece of advice is understand what you're buying. And again, like that's where your insurance, uh, your insurance agent is going to help you navigate. And we haven't really touched on like all the little other details that may or may not exist on your policy, right? In terms of, uh, again, how they display your personal property coverage. You're not, you're almost never going to be doing an apples to apples comparison. It's not like mm -hmm. you're going to have policy, you know, policy A, that's going to be all the exact same coverage as policy B, the exact same coverage. Because all these law insurance companies, they know where they're competing with each other. And they often like to differentiate their policies with additional coverages or combined coverages or some additional perks or things that they're giving you for free, right? And so you you have to make some of those evaluations of like, okay, mm -hmm. well, this company may be a better fit for me because they're giving at the same price point, they're giving this additional coverage as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into like the different types of coverage? So, so we've we we covered we covered the we covered the core uh, the mm -hmm. core coverages, but mm -hmm. right all insurance policies have uh, can have a, what are called endorsements, which are basically mm -hmm. additional modifications added to them. And yeah. some companies add these endorsements by by standard on the policy. This has again over time become a way of how insurance companies you know compete with each other. So a very common one, for example, would be something like a, a, a water backup water backup coverage, which is coverage for if water backs up through your uh, your sump or your, your utility pipes and causes damage within the house, right? So there's a very common home like homeowner's claim that can occur. And that some insurance companies are going to add a limit free, you know, free of charge effectively onto their base policy, right? Um, most insurance companies, as a matter of fact, almost all of them offer this as a coverage that you can purchase but again, mm -hmm. you're going to have to modify your policy to add it on. And so there is this, as part of when you're shopping around for insurance, you might have this conversation with your insurance agent in terms of like, what are the most standard additional coverages or endorsements that I would want into my policy? And then how much do I need of them, right? We talked about jewelry as well. So our personal articles floater, which again, it's a fancy way of saying, you know, it's an endorsement for your personal jewelry, or if you have... I don't know, a comic book collect collection or a really expensive bicycle or something like that, or gym equipment, something, right? There's all sorts of subclasses of personal property that you might want to get more specifically insured because of what they are. I remember at one time I helped a uh, friend out that was touring around uh, New York and he had a, a you know a $300,000 violin. So he had a renter's insurance policy Renters insurance policy was about five hundred dollars. The violin mm -hmm. policy was about you know five thousand dollars. So wow. that's and that's the addendum <laughs> to the insurance. Well, because again, obviously the value of what's being insured there at that time. But the, <laughs> that's the <laughs> right, and that's so that's the nuance there again of like mm -hmm. obviously what you're trying to protect at the end of the day, and why you have the specific conversation around what's being insured. Mm -hmm. um, and these yeah you know, these little coverages that can obviously be negotiated and manipulated onto the policy based on your needs. Because mm. there do seem to be a lot of different types. And I think that would be quite overwhelming for anyone who's just getting started is, do I really need <laughs> this one where the water backs up in the pipes? I don't know. It's never happened to me before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it, for homeowners, um, it's also, you know, a big consideration of, again, 
insurance agents typically mm-hmm. nowadays of, over the evolution of time, right? Have uh, <laughs> and really not just the agents, but the companies themselves have a great track record of data as well to support you know where these claims could come from, right? And ha- their occurrence, of course. Um, but there are a number of the most common coverages that we touched upon, right? With water backup being one of the most common ones for homeowners, um, jewelry, you know, endorsements, things like that. Another one would be, you know, equipment breakdown coverage, which is basically if your equipment, uh, at your, any of your household appliances or electronics is, uh, electronics malfunction or have a, suffer from a power surge, depending on the state or, you know, the property where it's located. Some of these things may or may not be more common than others. For example, we used to ensure, you know, several Florida residents that we're not going to touch on, you know, on flood insurance today, <laughs> but flood insurance is a whole ancillary coverage that you would typically buy in addition to home insurance. But water backup is a, you know, a very serious thing there, of course, because of the fluctuations in the hurricane season and what happens with the water. There. So. Mm. so- is there a practice that you do to manage your insurance policies that you have? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing that we talked about, again, right, is uh, the, the practice is, is reviewing your policies annually, mm-hmm. um, at the very least. And and secondly, uh, kind of alongside that is if they do change, understand, understand why they changed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of what you would expect from uh, the insurance is a contract. It's a contract. Mm-hmm. And so if all of a sudden you're getting charged more, understand why you're getting charged more. Um, and this is again, where all kind of uh, tamper expectations that, you know, insurance companies generally, uh, it's not a surprise if costs go up over time for home insurance, at least because your property is depreciating, is, is degradating in terms of like that roof and the, uh, all the appliances that we talked about, right? They're getting in worse and worse condition. And mm-hmm. in general, at least in the, the U.S. markets, right? Like the price of uh, the price of the materials is going to increase. We saw a huge spike in renewals uh, with when the lumber market prices, you know, uh, in the past two years have started started to skyrocket. Obviously, those materials are used for homes, and so the ensuing replacement cost of properties have you know, increased as well. Yeah. Yeah. I did think what happens when all the building costs increase, uh, then I guess the price to rebuild a home increases and insurance increases. No. Mm. Yeah. And it, it's not, uh, and it's not a hard and fast rule because insurance mm-hmm. companies can sometimes um, mitigate this very differently. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll, but yeah, the big, uh, you know, the big rule for the insurance compliance is that they have to rate all of their common customers uh, similarly, right? They can't mm-hmm. discriminate between one customer and another, um, but as long as they are, you know, applying that that rate increase equally, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so we do have some questions from the audience as well. Um, so let's see. What steps can homeowners take to reduce the cost of their home insurance premiums? Yeah, great question. Um, and this was segue. So we talked about mitigation, um, right? And those are really when we talk about cost. When it comes to insurance, still be fine because so we talked mm-hmm. about costs, right? So the, the way you can outright decrease your cost, right, is by installing whatever discount and devices that the insurance company, right, says are going to decrease your premium. Now, mm-hmm. is this really saving you money? Well, it depends. Because it depends how much. You're obviously, again, I just told you to go out and buy, a, you know, an alarm. Well, that alarm is going to cost you something. So whether or not it saves you money on the whole, I don't know. But it will decrease your insurance premium, right? Mm-hmm. But the other, and this is actually something that we should have uh, touched upon, right? Is the inverse relationship between your insurance policy cost and your deductible? I mean, your deductible. The, the dreaded aspect of your insurance policy is what you have to pay before your insurance company starts paying on a claim. Mm-hmm. And you can think about it as the threshold of when you're going to want to submit a claim. So uh, 
that is always going to have an inverse relationship with the cost of your policy. So the lower your deductible, mm -hmm. let's just say, let's just use real examples. Let's say your policy costs 100, uh, I'm sorry. Let's say your policy costs $1,000 annually, right? And your deductible is also a thousand dollars. Let's keep it simple. Okay. That means that when you have a claim, you have to pay a thousand dollars and then your insurance company will start paying for everything else after that. Right. If you were to decrease your deductible to let's say five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. your annual your annual cost might go up to, I don't know, let's call it um one thousand two hundred dollars. Because again, now you only have to pay five hundred dollars when you have a claim mm -hmm. and your insurance company will start paying dollars, you know, dollar one after that. So it's always an inverse relationship. The opposite is also true. If you take a higher deductible and your premium has got to go down, if you, you say, oh, I'm going to take a deductible of $5,000, that means you're paying the first $5,000 of any claim. That means you're not going to file a claim on anything that's $5,000 or less. Wouldn't make sense. Mm -hmm. you, you can't. There's nothing for the insurance company to cover at that point. Right? So... And and the insurance company in that scenario, right, might we might charge you, I don't know, seven hundred dollars annually. So there's always mm -hmm. an inverse relationship there, right? Okay, so how does how do you pick what your deductible would be? It's really it's yeah, it's a it's a funny question because yeah, you know, consumers will really typically come to me and say, like, oh, how do I pick the right one? Well, the truth is it's up to you because that's your mm -hmm. threshold for risk tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also again returns to that second question. How do I use it? Which is also tied to how do you want to use your insurance, right? Is your insurance your absolute backup plan? I've talked to and I talked to some customers and they say, I'm buying insurance because my my mortgage company wants me to get insurance. But some customers, you know, they'll tell me I don't believe in insurance. So they just want <laughs> they just want the highest deductible. They'll literally buy a policy, fifty thousand dollar deductible. They don't plan to ever use it because they say if anything happens to my house. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to take care of it myself. Doesn't really matter. I'm not going to file any claims. Doesn't matter. They're not paying that $50,000 because they're not, they don't intend to use that insurance, right? So mm -hmm. they get a very low annual premium, right? They're mm -hmm. going to pay very low annually and they have that protection. And it's basically only there maybe if the entire house is destroyed, right? If they're not a true act of God in the house, and then and they say like, okay, well, if the whole house is destroyed, I'm not going to pay a million dollars and rebuild it. I'm just going to pay fifty thousand dollars, right? Mm. So, even there, and even in that, and that's a very extreme example. But even there, you can immediately understand the value of home insurance because mm -hmm. you're still paying fifty thousand dollars to get back a million dollar house. That's still a heck of a deal compared to paying a million dollars. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So, but it's really a, a matter of risk preference and risk tolerance there. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, you will see, and clients will often ask to understand kind of what the bell curve looks like in terms of the, you know, the return of like how much does it, you know, how much does that annual premium pay, you know, change based on how much I hire or lower my deductible. Mm -hmm. uh, so our second audience question is: How do insurance, how do insurers define storm, and how do they decide if a storm has caused damage? Great question. And again, returns to our friend the deductible because some mm -hmm. insurance companies will um, not just assign one deductible, a kind of all applicable deductible, but might specify separate deductibles, which I, I'm assuming is where this question comes from because the specification of a storm, you could have a separate storm deductible, which means if your house takes damage from a storm, then that deductible is going to apply. Um, again, very common in coastal areas where storms are going to be kind of like a known uh, frequency there. So uh, how they define storm is typically they'll, they'll refer to as a name storm deductible, which is exactly what it sounds. If there's, if that hurricane, uh, if it's a, a hurricane or a storm that has a name, then that's going to, then that, then that coverage is going to apply. And so they're going to look at the date range and say, so here in New York, New Jersey, right, obviously we had Sandy several years ago now at this point, but when Hurricane Sandy came, right, um, as a named hurricane, and the damage that occurred in that time was obviously attributed to that hurricane. Um, and the reason this matters, right, 
is because this is how insurance companies mitigate the fact that obviously when a named hurricane comes through, it's not just hitting your house. It's not just hitting one house, right, in, in the area. It's hitting the whole area and likely the whole region. And if the ins- and sometimes the insurance companies will are essentially hedging that region by saying, yeah, you know, we'll cover everyone's, you know, we'll cover everyone's claims according to their personal deductibles. But if a hurricane comes into this region, we need to apply a higher deductible. We need we need the insureds to cover a higher portion themselves before we come in and start paying from dollar zero. Mm. That's interesting that yeah, the storm has to be named because what happens if there's just a normal storm and a tree falls through the roof? Yeah. So tip, so so again, this is a little bit a little bit more new uh, nuance here. So this um, where there could be a separate deductible that's just your your what they refer to in the U.S. as a wind hail deductible, mm-hmm. just any damage that comes fr- resulting from wind or hail, and it doesn't have to be named in that case. Um, oh, okay. Typically, a storm. Typically, a storm, a storm deductible or, or a hurricane deductible, it refers to it has to be a named incident. But if it's, uh, there can be a separate wind hail coverage or wind hail deductible. Mm-hmm. So a, a, a policy, for example, I'll give you an example, like a policy in Florida might be a thousand dollar regular deductible or what they call an all perils deductible. Mm-hmm. Then you might have a 2% wind hail deductible. And I'll get to what that 2% means in a second. And then you might have a 5% named storm or, uh, deductible. And mm-hmm. those percentages are referring to, again, that dwelling value that we talked about. So in proportion to how much your home is insured for, that's how much you have to pay before before your insurance uh, company covers the rest. Okay. Yeah. What, what about things that are not covered? Like... Um, I feel like this happened a few years ago. I can't remember, but um, but I think there were some floods in Australia and it turns out some people weren't insured for floods when they thought they were, probably because they hadn't right. read the insurance documents properly. <laughs> but um, I think it was a flood prone region. So like, why would they insure it and not include those things? Or why would they remove it? So at least, yeah, and again, I'd have to you know, look more and throw to you know, Aust- Aust- the Aust- Australian compliance laws that pertains to this, but largely this is true for most universal insurance laws. The uh, home insurance isn't isn't going to cover anything that would immediately that would be covered specifically on a separate insurance policy, mm-hmm. right? And so that is why I mentioned earlier, right, that flood insurance is typically covered on its own policy. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's just the way it's been sold over time, um, as its own as its own product, and so uh, the expectation there, right, would be for the consumer to purchase flood insurance separately. Uh, and the reason it's done that way, at least you know, mostly in the U.S., is because one, it's a, it's a very specialized form of insurance coverage that's not always going to be required, obviously, for all of the U.S., but also because there are uh, government entities in some areas that also supply that coverage. Because in, you know, in Florida, again, there's another example, there are certain reserve programs and pools that help provide that coverage in a more affordable rate because, uh, I mean, the, because simple because of how the state, you know, suffers from those losses, of course. Mm. Um, but so that, you know, that is, but you, you point out that, you know, the, the biggest thing there, right, that flooding isn't covered on your home insurance policy, you know, period. Um, mm. Unless you you're you're buying a separate policy, basically to cover that in many, most cases. Okay, yeah. Um, I just assumed that it was covered, so that's something I've learned today. <laughs> I'll have to get. Oh, actually, I don't need it because I'm on the first floor. But you know, <laughs> there is um, there's another common example of that that our mm-hmm. friends, you know, I'm, I myself am on the east coast, but our friends on the west coast have to deal with earthquake insurance. Mm. Um, earthquake insurance, similar to flood insurance, isn't going to be covered on your on your home insurance policy. So you would again buy a separate policy for that. Um, again, big reason for that is because it's a more specialized product. That's not. It's not going to be. I mean, I live in New Jersey, and you know, I've, I've never. Maybe I've, I've supposedly felt an earthquake once or twice in my life. So it's not exactly a prominent coverage around here. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess the only issue then is when it happens unexpectedly in an area that doesn't historically have earthquakes. 
Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely. Mm. Right. And particularly with global warming, I guess that that is probably some of those natural events are happening. Um, but that's a that's a topic for another yeah. day. <laughs> that is a <laughs> that is a certainly a macabre topic. But yeah, yes. that is a reality and something that the insurance industry does. You know, not just the insurance industry, but you know, compliance industries and regulation, and of course, like just for the better well-being of humanity, like they, they do monitor over time, right? Of mm. course, you mentioned global warming, that's global warming, flooding issues, earthquake issues, how they evolve over time. You know, a couple of years ago, areas of the U.S. that really had never had um, a very severe winter were suddenly in freezing, in freezing conditions. Uh, that was a huge, a huge blow to homeowners in Texas, for example. That suddenly their homes were never, you know. Setting aside the insurance, the builders there, their homes were never built or conceived for the fact that the piping would freeze. And suddenly you have hundreds of thousands of people that don't have access to water because their piping is just completely shattered because the winter was way too cold. Mm. So we're going to do the open mic now. So this is where you get to talk about um, something that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be related to the topic today. So you said you've picked something. Uh, do you want to explain it? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. It's uh, uh, it's related actually to what we talked about earlier. One of my earliest mentors through that course in economics, I learned he himself, the, the professor, uh, led an extraordinary life that they'd actually um, made a movie, made a movie on his life as a as a single father working his way through school uh, and going on to, like I said, work on Wall Street. But you know, he. We pulled me aside one day. We had a long talk. I had some questions on some things. And he said to me, you know, be skeptical. And that really, at first I didn't really understand what it meant. But then he went on to explain that, you know, for me, about being skeptical in terms of all things to better yourself. Uh, and we've talked a lot about it today in insurance, but it's something I've applied to my career in terms of becoming an expert and being ambitious in your career to understand really what you want to do. Um, one of my biggest things in, in life is to just make sure that you, you know, a lot of people say, you know, be passionate about what you're doing, find something you're passionate about. It's absolutely true, but also be invested in what you're doing. What I mean by that is really make sure that you apply yourself to give yourself an understanding of what you're going to be doing. And for me, you know, that was true of insurance, but not because I specifically chose to work in insurance, but because I specifically chose to immerse myself and talk to several experts on the side and really just get to learn from them. And to me, you know, being a student of you know, the insurance world is a very privilege to me and connected me with, you know, several people. On my end, what I always tell people is, is go and explore, go and take chances and become an expert of what you think you might want to do um, to, to really expose yourself to it. And whether it be learning a language, whether it be learning a new skill, you know, I always talk to people as like, how are you going to make yourself more marketable the next day? Uh, one of the things I do on the side pro bono is through my network is a you know a lot of advice for young you know young people trying to either change their careers or starting off their careers and don't really know what they're going to get into in the business world, and just connecting people and you know helping them understand and from each other's uh, you know points of view how they got into things they're doing how they can learn and how they can you know get more done for themselves to better themselves really at the end of the day. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, something that. Um, has happened to me is um, so I'm quite creative. So people are like, oh, you should turn the things you make into businesses. Um, but I find that actually really decreases um, my enjoyment in it. So in some ways it's like you can have the passion in one place, but then as long as you find worth and investment and you invest yourself into your career, then you're gonna find, I guess, success, um, satisfaction in that area, even if it's not yep. your passion. It's you're right. It's it's a trade off, and I actually completely mm. sympathize with you um, because yeah, I uh, I was raised more or less a creative myself, but you know found that I wanted to really make more of a career in kind of a, a technical side, and ended up working right on the technology and the insurance side of things. Uh, but to me, yeah, I still have several creative hobbies, whether it be on the, on the music end or in drawing. And I do those mostly for myself. I actually do those mostly as a way of detachment. Um, but similarly to you, right? It's like people say, well, then find a way to monetize it. Nick, yeah, maybe. And maybe maybe you do wear it one day. 
But um, to me, it's much more about being, you know, well rounded in that that concept and and doing things for your own fulfillment. Mm. Yeah, that's thank you for that um, that of advice. I, I really liked that. Um, so, if people want to find out more about you, um, where should they go? Yeah, sure. I don't I don't have much of a website or anything, but you can certainly look me up on LinkedIn. You, uh, Fabio uh, Fabio Fossi. So. Please feel free to reach out. Like I said, I, I try to stay active there mostly because um, I found a, a lot of fulfillment in helping other people in my network, um, especially in the U.S. You know, there's a number of people in the tech ecosystem uh, from you know layoffs um, or uh, especially uh, you know on the tech end, um, a lot of the a lot of the former Fang companies and other tech companies that you know have been hit during the recession. Uh, their well, the onsu potential recession and. More importantly, the uh, you know, the COVID pandemic and how it's moved and displaced people. And I've been fortunate enough that I've had a number of great mentors in my life. And so it's my way to give back to them in their careers. That's really great that you're willing to mentor people. I think um, everyone needs a mentor in their life. Um, and we'll make sure we put your LinkedIn uh, uh, LinkedIn link um, in sure. our show notes so people can find you easily. Fantastic. Great. Thanks for joining me today. It was really lovely to talk to you. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Gabrielle. Thank yeah. you. You've been listening to On the House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.